Revocable Trust versus Bank of America, 720032. Do I have all parties? Yes, sir. We had other parties last time. Uh, the other party. Let me let you make your appearance yes. and then we'll find it out. Thank you so much. Good morning, Aaron. Joseph Long for Plaintiff Jimmy Jack. No, a Tobin, pro se litigant. Your Honor, the other parties didn't uh, file any written uh, as to this motion, as to this. Okay, but were they given notice of today's hearing? Yes, but Nation Star did not object to my uh, motion to intervene. Okay. I, I believe they. I believe they were, Your Honor. Looking at the e-service. Well, I was e-serve, so I, I, I got it. Okay. And once again, you may or may not be aware that we don't. We don't get copies of all your e-service <clears throat> unless it's attached to a pleading, because we can't. Because if you think about all the communications you all, everyone does through e-service. We're not supposed to have notice of certain things. Okay. So. I have the opposition to your motion to intervene. Um, now, I got an untimely, you know your reply was untimely by more than 18 days. Your motion, your opposition, your reply document, there's, no, this yes, was late. Let me double check. Well, okay. For purposes of what I see, we have the motion to intervene on 729. We have the oops. I have to go here. The opposition on 830. So he was opposed and he was late. And then yours was not even, then we had an affidavit filed on 923 and a reply on 99. The affidavit is what I was referencing when so I said. That was to supplement. Um, but you can't supplement without order, leave of court. <clears throat> and you need to do your oppositions on time. So are both sides going to waive? And the court should have taken into consideration and did take it. Would you like the court to take into consideration all pleadings on this? That, that's yeah. fine, Your Honor. The... Uh, Yes, and, and I'm ready to argue, and I just wanted the court to know sure. our opposition, we were kind of waiting, as, as the court is aware, is that whole consolidation, because this thing, this was filed in the other, but no, nonetheless, yeah, we were, I waited. Nonetheless, right. you know you need to leave a court to not file it right. for timeliness aspects, right. so and if there's something pending, just like you do, supplemental pleadings, okay, because otherwise you can imagine people would file all sorts of things all the time, and lots of them. Motion, opposition, reply, anything else needs court leave. Um, so, you can tell me quickly about, you say that you meet the standards, you say they don't, so for motion to intervene, go ahead. The standards to intervene. Now, you're just here on behalf of yourself, right? Correct. Because you're a licensed attorney, because the request is both on behalf of yourself and Mr. Hansen. But I don't have right. a Mr. Hansen and, present. And, right, because he lives in California and he, he won't be at anything. So, I... If he um, won't be at anything, then how be, does he participate in a case? Is he, he going to? won't be participating. Um, the, the reason I filed that supplemental affidavit was to explain exactly what our relationship was. We're not two random individuals. We are the beneficiaries of the Gordon B. Hansen Trust, and I am the successor trustee mm -hmm. of that trust. That trust was the equitable title holder of the subject property at the time of the disputed HOA sale. What do you and mean by the equitable title holder? I mean, there was a, a bargain grant sale deed. It, the, the title on the property was to the Gordon B. Hansen Trust. Gordon B. Hansen passed away in 2012, and I became the successor trustee. And so I started managing this property trying to sell it. And so I've done everything over the last number of years, four years, to deal with um, all of the issues around this property. Did you ever, your successor trustee under the trust, okay, go ahead. Okay, so, and, and in addition to being the, the trustee that can take all the action on behalf of the trust, I am also a 50% beneficiary. 
So Steve Hansen, son of the grantor, is the other person. So the reason I put his name on there was because I am, you know, I have authority under uh, the trust to represent the trust, but I didn't want to have a problem with being only a 50% beneficiary. Okay. But, That's the reason I did that. And I appreciate you representing yourself and proper person. And But when I see slash S's, okay, which slash S is for signatures, and I saw Mr. Hansen's, but I only saw your name on any pleading from a signatory standpoint. Right. So how do I know that he wants to intervene when I don't see my point was I was going to ask him if he was here you know what I mean because I didn't see him anywhere in the documents and it seemed to be kind of you, totally you steering the boat which is fine which right. depends it may or may not be fine but how do I know that he wants to intervene um, he is absolutely indifferent to what what goes on in this case like if if I never filed anything if I never did anything as the trustee he he would be indifferent. But, but you understand, since I don't have him here and I have no affidavit declaration or anything from him, mm -hmm. it's the same thing I'd be saying to anyone. Right. Uh, you, since you're not a licensed, you're not a licensed attorney in the state right. of Nevada, so you're not representing him in the legal capacity. Is that a correct statement? Right. I am only representing him in the sense that I am the trustee. trustee. Which does okay. Let me hear their opposition and then go back to you for final word. Okay. Thank you so much. You can sit down. Whatever's more comfortable for you. Go ahead. Enter, enter briefly and. And all that is, is quite irrelevant for the purpose of this motion. Number one, it's grossly untimely as to why the, the request is being sought now, not two, three years ago. And we have a whole statute of limitations argument on that, but that's not for here at this time. More importantly, they did not, she did not attach a copy of the proposed pleading to her underlying motion. She attached it, I believe, to her reply, which we could not, we can't do a sole reply to that. So based on the underlying motion not complying with the rule, her motion should not be granted. Again, it's very clear if she would have attached her proposed pleading, then in our opposition we could have addressed that. But we, our opposition was very short, rather. Okay. Would it make sense, since I've got issues of Mr. Hansen and i got issues of reply, that I were to continue this hearing? That, that. And then give them an opportunity because you filed this document on 923 the hearings today right they should have a chance to respond don't you think do so that or i strike it and if i strike it then it's untimely if i strike it as untimely then you don't have a basis and so if i let them respond to your reply the argument with regards to the underlying complaint and i continue this hearing it gives you a chance also i need something notarized at mr hansen's position right then at least I can address this on the merits, because right now... I, I totally agree, but I, but I would request on behalf of my client, Your Honor, the motion be denied, and if she wants to refile properly, then she can. And I'm not making any accusations as to ghostwriters, but it's pretty clear from the pleadings, there's a ghostwriter here. We know that. A, a pro se litigant doesn't prepare pleadings like has been prepared here. But nonetheless, it's neither here nor there, but the rule is very, very clear. The pleading has to be attached, and... Rather than continuing it, I, I am asking the court to just deny it, and I guess without prejudice, and they could refile. And that way the, the, uh, the proper time period for opposition's replies can be set. What the counsel is saying, he's technically correct under the rules. However, the court has some limited discretion with regards to pro se litigants, and the court doesn't look at, you know, the, the quality of writing style in evaluating pro se litigants, because remember, pro se litigants can have bar degrees. They can have master's degrees. They can have doctorates, or they could just be great writers, okay? They could be writers who are writing it. So I don't look at the nature of the pleading. What I have to look at is, are the rules been followed? So there really is two choices here. One is, counsel's correct, I could deny it without prejudice. You need to refile it and refile it appropriately and follow the rules, okay? The other choice I was just trying to see from a convenience standpoint, because if they refile and you have to redo your opposition anyway, is whether the parties wanted to mutually agree that I continue today's hearing and give you an opportunity to respond. So. Again, I'd rather it be without prejudice, Your Honor, so we can kind of get it more cleaner. And, and, and also, since 
it's uh, the pleadings, the timeliness, and everything's been waived. Now we know, so they're in the next round. If they're going to refile, then we got to comply with the timeliness requirements, including um, um, their reply after. So they're going to refile. Council, yeah. I mean, I appreciate. Be careful the stone you're throwing in the glass house right now, because while I understand, and you may not be aware that there was some other things going on in this case and how it got consolidated to this department. The reason why I was pointing that way is because there was another case in that department. So there was intervening things. So I see from a practical standpoint why your opposition was right. filed. But once again, if you're asking her to follow the rules real specifically, then you could have sought leave to have filed a delayed opposition pending. <laughs> now, whether you filed it in Judge Miley's court or filed it in this court, you still had the opportunity to do so. So that's why I was trying to go really for the practical thing of continuing this getting it teed up correctly. However, he is correct that there's a pro per se without attaching the motion to intervene to your underlying motion. I really should have taken it off calendar initially, but when I see a pro se litigant, I try and give people an opportunity as the rules allow some limited. Pro se litigants have to know all the rules, but it does allow the court to have some limited latitude. So in this particular case, I filed on the 29th of July, mm -hmm. and this uh, Jimmy Jack case was only consolidated in on August 4th. Correct. And because it was earlier, um, this uh, Nation Star case was, uh, you know, subsumed under it. But, so... He's not going as to timing. He's going as to, you didn't attach the motion to intervene, which has to, under the rules, specifically be attached to your motion. Regardless of when you filed it, right. it's what you had to have attached. The timeliness issue, you each got issues right. on the timeliness issue. So I kind of give you a, each a clean slate on that. But then he has the additional issue of saying you didn't attach the, right, I understand. Uh, the, the, mo the actual complaint because they need to respond to that complaint. All right, I, I understand. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, so I, I initially thought, you know, it was just like, will you let us in and then do the complaint later? But I do understand what you're saying. The other, the question that I have is that whether you deny it or whether we continue it, do do you want me to just take him off? I can't give you that advice. I'm only the judge. What what I what the judge needs to do is if I have anyone in front of me, okay? Either counsel, if it's a represented by counsel, they say they represent A, B, C, okay? Or maybe it's only A and B, or maybe it's just A. And so what I do is I look to see, okay, who are all the parties? Are they either A, represented, or B, do I have that they're filing something in their own name that they want to be here, okay? Because one pro se litigant can't represent another pro se litigant. You can represent yourself, but you can't represent somebody else. That's why I always ask if somebody's licensed to practice law in the state of Nevada because then the rules are different. They can ask in representative capacity. So whether he wishes to participate or not participate is not anything that I can play any role in making that determination. I would just ask the same thing that I would ask anyone when I see two names and I only see certain things with one person's name on it. I just would ask, is this person intending to participate? Do the, did they wish to do this? Because that's the fair answer because... You can't have, say you put 10 names on, right? Mm -hmm. From a fairness standpoint, some people don't want to be in litigation. Some people do. If there's ever a question, I always ask because that's the fair way to find out. So you need to make the determination, or he needs to make the determination, how the pleading should be. But I think even in light of that, it makes the most sense to deny without prejudice the pending motion. And why I'm denying it is I'm denying it procedurally. I'm not denying it substantively. I'm denying it procedurally because it did not have the attached motion to intervene, okay? So it's denied without prejudice, which means things can be refiled. Who chooses to refile, how you choose to refile, when you choose to refile, you need to make all those determinations. If there's Legal Aid Self-Help Center down on the first floor, they can be of some assistance sometimes, given certain circumstances. If you're qualified for legal aid for representation, there's pro bono attorneys available for that. Um, other than that, I court can't provide any advice, okay? Thank you so very much. Um, Council for Jamie Jack, you'll prepare an order, denied without prejudice, procedurally circulated, and then provide it back to the court. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Page nine. Um, one moment, please. Page, yeah, page nine.